you guys, and I'm actually very excited and happy to bring this video to you uh, guys because this is a setup I've been working on restoring for quite some time. This is the iconic Gateway 2000 4DX2 66V. Uh, this is the desktop version. There's actually a really great video on YouTube that features the tower version of this machine. It's uh, Silicon Classics, I believe is the channel's name. And that's a really great video. Uh, I encourage all of you to watch it. But this here, this is the desktop version of that machine. And when I received this, maybe oh, almost a year ago, um, it was just a mess. It's not perfect, but I mean, the case was all messed up. There's pretty much uh, just the case, real dirty case, and the motherboard. Uh, this drive was in there, this drive, this right here, but there, these were empty, no hard drive. Um, I think there were two cards in there. There was a SCSI card, which we'll look at, and there was uh, just a random ISA video card in there. Definitely not what came with this machine, but I mostly pieced it together. Um, it's mostly stock at the moment. I, I went back, I looked at advertisements uh, for this machine, asked a lot of people online, different forms like Vogan's, uh, what was the original configuration of this machine. Again, looked at advertisements, old PC magazines from the time, and I've got something close. In, in most ways, it's a little bit upgraded. There's a couple points where it's not quite uh, what the stock was, a little bit less than what that what, what it was sold as stock, but most of it is like a slight, a tasteful upgrade. Um, things like the hard drive's a little bit bigger, things like that. The video card's a little teeny bit uh, different than what it came with uh, stock. But yeah, I really love this machine. This is, this is awesome looking. Uh, like I said, this is a really kind of iconic 486 uh, OEM machine. Of course, Gateway 2000. Uh, before they were just known as Gateway. And uh, yeah, this is the Ford DX2 it ha uh, 66V. It has a DX2 processor at 66 megahertz, and the V is for the VESA local bus, the VLB uh, bus, which the motherboard does have. Uh, drives here, I tried to configure it how it was configured stock. Um, I believe uh, from what I've seen with pictures online and uh, magazine advertisements, the CD drive was on the bottom, and this drive was in the middle and then the five and a quarter inch floppy was at the top. Uh, as you can see, here's the case. There's a reset button, hard drive light, power light, a key lock, turbo button. Oddly enough, I don't know why, but this turbo button does not work, nor does the light. Um, the light, the LED actually works because I can kind of bridge the jumpers and it will light up, it will stay lit up, but I can't get it to a state where it will light up or turn off depending on if I hit this. And no matter how I hook this up, uh, it doesn't affect the speed. So that's the one thing I haven't been able to restore or fix. I really don't know why. Um, this is an interesting case. It's big. It is heavy. Uh, you might be wondering where the power button is. It's actually a switch on the side. It's kind of more of an old school thing um, setup where usually, you know, old school, a lot of old school computer setups have the switch on the side. Uh, we have three five and a quarter inch bays, no three and a half inch bays. That kind of came back to haunt me a little bit later when I was fixing this thing up and restoring it. But um, yeah, it's it's a cool machine. I've got here the uh, Gateway 2000. This is the NE key keyboard. It's a little bit yellowed. I didn't actually get this with this computer. I actually happened across this thing at a swap meet a few months after I got this and I, of course, snatched it up right away. Uh, it fully works. Like I said, just a little bit yellowed and uh, the characters are a bit faded, but yeah, other than that, this is just like an awesome machine. I'm really happy I got this thing, you know, up and running, uh, and I'm happy I get to share it with you guys. So, we'll take a quick look at the back, and then we'll open it up and we'll check it out inside. So here's the back of this machine. It's with the white case and the white, it's almost like a polar bear, like hiding in the Arctic wastes or something. <laughs> it blends in really well with the bed here. Should have went with a black sheet, uh, but oh well. Uh, like I said, here's the the power switch right here on the side, regular three prong standard power connector, serial parallel ports, and uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight slots for expansion, and an AT keyboard. So, again, not uh, too interesting on the back. Computers uh, rarely are that interesting on the back. Well, unless you're looking, you know, you find one at a swap meet or a yard sale or something. <laughs> you want to see if there's any good sound or video cards. Sometimes you get a good idea by uh, checking it out, the expansion slots on the back. But if you already know, uh, the back usually isn't too exciting. 
So we, of course we have to talk about the Gateway 2000 any key keyboard that came with these machines. Now this one is for one of the little bit later models. It has a PS2 connector on here because they did kind of cheap out on these guys and they went to a PS2 connector but you can just use one of these super cheap and easy to find PS2 to AT keyboard connectors or adapters and it works just fine as an AT keyboard. But this thing is massive and it is awesome. I lucked out finding one of these actually separate from this. A few months after I got this machine I actually found this keyboard kind of randomly at uh, sort of a swap meet situation and yeah you see you've got function keys over here you've got function keys up here uh, right here you have like multi eight directional directions <laughs> you have these uh, then you have you know this is standard here and then you have these extra things here for programming uh, macros let me see here you have program macro suspend macro repeat rate and then remap there's even a little tech note still on here about, uh, you know, you use Control-Alt, Suspend Macro uh, to reset in case you do mess things up. But yeah, very interesting and cool keyboard. It's a little bit faded. It's a little bit hard to see. Maybe these got, uh, this keyboard got a lot of use, but you can still see it, but it's a little faded. But I am really happy to have this keyboard to go along with the machine itself. So I want to talk real quick about the little rubber feet that came on this computer. Now this is the original sort of foot that came on it. A uh, little rubbery, kind of clear. It's not very clear now. I don't know if it ever was really clear, but one of these little guys. Now, when I got this machine, it was missing one of the feet, and the other ones were kind of not holding on that great. So I did decide to replace them, and this is kind of the best I could find. I think it goes with it all right. It's not clear, but it is white. It's more or less the same size. I just kind of picked these up at uh, Ace Hardware. And they have adhesive pads on the back, but I also used super glue. They seem to be holding on pretty... <laughs> I do this like, ugh, and I'm, but I'm really not trying that much because I don't want to break it off, but just some light moving around. It, it seems to be stuck on there pretty well, so that's good. So, you know, if you need to replace those, there are sort of replacements out there that you can find pretty easy. Uh, maybe I could have found the exact ones if I looked a little harder when on eBay, but these work just fine. You don't really see them anyways, but just wanted to point that out. Okay, so now we have the cover off. Let's take a quick look inside this guy. Maybe not too quick of a look, uh, but here we go. I'll start off over here with the hard drive. So uh, right here what I have installed is a uh, Caviar 2850. And this is a 853.6 megabyte hard drive. It's a little bit bigger what would have came stock in it. I don't know the brand that would have came stock in these things, but from what I could tell, stock hard drive size was around, you know, 500, 515 megabytes. So this is a little bit bigger than stock, but we're in the same ballpark. Okay, so moving over here, here are the drives. We've seen these with the case on, of course. Now, I had a little bit of trouble uh, getting these installed because this machine, unfortunately, uses the rail system. So if you can see here, it guides in on these little rails and then it screws in on the front here. Uh, so like I didn't have enough rails, I had to borrow some from other computer systems. So this one's firmly attached. Now these are all in there very well, but I couldn't find the rails with these little front screw in pieces for all of that one's unscrewed, but it's a little bent anyways. But I, if you can see, look really carefully, I don't know if this camera will pick up because the light, but I did have like other little plastic, more generic rails that I put in. So they didn't screw in the front, but as long as I screwed in one on the front, um, it's they're pretty secure in there. So not a big deal, but just be aware that this case uh, does use these rails. I hate the rail system, but uh, whatever. So let's talk about the issues I had really quick with... Uh, putting in a CD-ROM drive. Well, first we'll just talk about the hard drive itself. So, initially putting in the hard drive, I was having some issues. Uh, actually, the built-in BIOS was seeing this hard drive. It didn't seem to have trouble actually seeing hard drives over the 500 megabyte barrier in the BIOS and everything, but it did have trouble. I was having a lot of issues even when it was installed. So for instance, when I was installing the OS, I was getting a lot of errors, just a lot of corruption going on. And I, it, I think it had to do with the built-in IDE control. You can't see it right now uh, because of all these cables. We'll, we'll look at that in a little bit. But there is 
built-in uh, IDE controller on this motherboard with two two connectors, so theoretically you could support four IDE devices. Um, this machine's pretty old, so there could be some kind of malfunction or defect in the IDE controller just from age and wear and tear, and it wasn't really working correctly. Uh, so I bypassed that and I just did a add-on IDE controller card. And we'll talk about that in a minute when we talk about the expansion cards on this machine. So anyways, uh, once I had that card in there, no problems with the hard drive, detected it right away, installed the OS, no issues, no corruption. I've had no problems booting from the hard drive or using the hard drive since I started using that controller card separate from the IDE controller on the motherboard itself. The CD drive, on the other hand, was a nightmare. Um, well, first off, the, how this is set up, uh, even with the card here on the furthest uh, slot over to the right, I couldn't quite reach, you know, like this. So I would have had to, uh, I believe, probably have the hard drive over here, and then I would have to have sacrificed one of these drives because there's no even this there's this is a bay there's not a cutout on it so you can't have a floppy drive here so I would have had to sacrifice one of these drives if I put the hard drive here and you know use the hard drive cover you know just a blank cover and then the CD drive however um, so anyways yeah there was a cable issue because you know connecting it here and then over here it just wasn't quite reaching with the cables I had uh, but even worse than that it just would not work, no matter how I set it up. And I used every trick in the book. Uh, I used different slave and master combinations. I used, you know, the IDE connector 1 and 2. I used different cables. I even tried using the uh, connector on the sound card to hook up the CD-ROM drive, and it just would not work. Either the uh, hard drive would fail to spin up if you had a CD dr drive connected, uh, it would see the CD-ROM drive, but the drivers wouldn't see it, or it would just lock up on boot process. It was a nightmare. I don't think I've ever had a computer that <laughs> worked so hard to prevent me from connecting a CD-ROM drive. Now, I don't know the truth to this. I, I couldn't find it in any like official advertising material or anything, but according to some people online, some people I talked to in Vogans, uh, this model originally came with the CD-ROM drive, it was a SCSI CD-ROM drive. Again, I can't confirm that, but people have told me the stock configuration was SCSI just for the CD-ROM drive at least. Um, so, when I got this machine, it actually came with a SCSI controller card. Uh, it wasn't hooked up to anything, it was just there. So, you know, maybe that's some validity to that statement. Again, I don't know for sure, but I hooked up the CD-ROM drive to SCSI, and it worked fine, uh, except for me trying to remember, you know, the right SCSI driver. I haven't set up a SCSI uh, CD-ROM drive in a little while, so it took me a minute to remember how to do that and set it up. But after that, it has worked flawlessly. So I have the IDE hard drive here and then the CD-ROM drive on the SCSI uh, connector. Uh, I guess if I really wanted, I could just swap this out for a SCSI hard drive, but I don't see the point right now as it is. It's working just fine. So yeah, that was my little uh, story with the <laughs> my troubles with the, the CD-ROM drive. So if you're doing this, if you're storing one of these machines, if you're having problems with the whole CD drive, this could go for any machine really. Yeah, give SCSI a try. It might solve your problems there. Another tip is Oh, it fell down here now, but um, this motherboard, interesting enough, doesn't have a real-time clock battery on board. Not that I could see anyways. It didn't have a barrel. It didn't have one of those horrible Dallas RTCs, uh, anything like that. So uh, the connector, it's hard to see, but it's under there. It seems to only use an external battery source. Now, I used one of these these guys here, if you can see it down here. And, uh, these are really cool because they just use three AAA batteries, and I used that to replace uh, this guy. This is what was originally in there. Obviously, it was quite dead, uh, so I just got one of these things to replace it. And you definitely want to do that right off the bat because this machine will give you lots of weird problems if it doesn't have a CMOS battery uh, on it, so <laughs> at least one that's working. So just remember to do that right away. If you get one of these, uh, replace the battery, um, either with one of these that you know is working or with one of these guys down here that you can just use, uh, you know, regular batteries. 
So, okay, so I guess uh, with that out of the way, well, one more thing too while we're here. This, this is the power supply to this guy. This is one of the things I don't like about this machine. This is, uh, it uses an AT power supply, but this is kind of a non-standard form factor. It's a little bit sort of an older form factor because you've got the big switch on the side now. Now, I love the big switch on the side, but it's still inconvenient if this thing should die and you can't just pop in any old uh, AT power supply. You, you're going to have to find something with this form factor. Uh, you might be able to kind of hack one in there. Oops, stepped on a dog toy. You might be able to kind of like... <laughs> you might be able to just kind of shove one in there, maybe. I, I don't know, but this is definitely like bigger, I believe, than a regular AT. Uh, power supply and obviously you've got the switch here on the side so that's that's kind of annoying a uh, little issue uh, so far this thing's held up and it's worked fine but these aren't going to last forever and it's just going to make it that much more of a pain to have this different kind of form factor PSU all right so here's the motherboard itself as you can see we have eight 16-bit ISA slots and two of those slots are actually VLB local bus slots and that is why there is a V in the model number. Alright, so we'll start in this corner here. We have our RAM, our memory, and right now there is 16 megabytes installed. There's four banks of 70, for 72 pin RAM. Uh, I believe this does not support EDO, I believe it's only fast page. Uh, strangely enough, you'd think it's a very basic spec that you could find. I couldn't find the manual for this specific motherboard online, and I couldn't find, uh, you know, exacts about certain specifications. So, I actually could not find uh, what the max amount of RAM this thing will take. I did find a few sources that indicated the max amount was 16 megabytes. Um, if I find out between now and when I put this video up, I will add it in editing what the max RAM is. Uh, right here, but I think as far as I know right now, I believe it's 16 megabytes. So right here we have our socket for the CPU, and we have a upgrade socket. So these came with obviously a 66 megahertz Intel 486, um, and it also came with a nice little upgrade socket, so you could install a Pentium overdrive into this socket right here. Now right here is the L2 cache. Now this machine uses sort of a coast module, sort of like later uh, Intel boards. I don't see many 46 boards that actually use coast modules for its L2 cache. Now according to advertisements, this machine came standard with 256 uh, KB of L2 cache. Interesting enough, this uh, stick is only a 64 uh, KB of L2 cache. So uh, I don't know why that's less than what the standard was. Uh, I don't know if you could use or config these or if they had cheaper uh, models, I guess, maybe that had less cache uh, and maybe different components. Uh, as far as I can tell, there wasn't, I, I didn't really see any evidence of this, but you know, maybe there were uh, lesser SKUs. Uh, or maybe for some reason at some point uh, whoever owned this before me just decided to take out the 256 KB module and put in a, a smaller 64 KB. I, I don't know. Um, behind it we have a dip switch. Now I, I'm assuming that's for setting things like possibly RAM and front side bus or things like that, uh, what kind of CPU you have installed. Unfortunately, again, I can't find the manual online. Apparently the manual for this machine was very comprehensive, um, but I cannot figure out, uh, you know, I can't find any documentation on what exactly the switch settings for that is, uh, unfortunately, but I'm assuming it's just for things like setting, you know, your CPU and all that. Other than that, there's not much else uh, under there, just some chips. Here we have our two built-in uh, IDE connectors. And here's the floppy connector. And then right here we have things, you know, for our uh, our different parallel, parallel and serial ports. So no PS2 mouse on this model, so you'll be using a serial mouse, uh, AT keyboard connector, and again, uh, no battery connector, no Dallas RTC or barrel battery or lithium battery. Just this connector right here for a external battery. Now as I showed you earlier, originally came with one of those Rayovac batteries, but you, these, uh, oh, the cover came off, <laughs> but these tend to work uh, just fine. So these are one of those, uh, those AAA battery things. I'll have to secure that cover more. So here we have a, actually have a real speaker uh, hooked up here in the front behind these little guide rails. Uh, that's where our various things like, you know, reset and turbo switch and all those uh, 
and all those uh, connectors go. And right here, because I'm using a separate IDE card, I'm connecting the uh, IDE, you know, the hard drive activity light uh, to the card. So I, ex you know, extended them a little bit with some electrical tape and two of these little connectors, and then this connects to that SIG uh, EIDE card. All right, so the first expansion card we're going to look at here is what I was talking about earlier. This did not come stock with this machine. This was something I added because I was having issues with the built-in IDE controller. And this is just a 16-bit ISA um, EIDE controller. Uh, so right here you can see there's a floppy controller here and then we have two IDE con uh, connectors for four devices. And putting this thing in really solved my problems. Uh, I stopped having any kind of issues with data being corrupted when I was for instance, loading something from a floppy onto the hard drive. This detected my drive, no problem. I even tested some other drives. I had like a four gigabyte drive, detected it, no problem. And uh, it's just worked great. Speed seems to be increased a bit uh, over what I was getting on the uh, built-in IDE controller. Just really nice. If you have one of these, uh, it's just it's really nice for improving your performance. At least for me, it seemed to significantly help the situation. And since we're talking about you know controllers, this is a Bus Logic BT 440C slash 445C, and this is the SCSI controller I'm using now. Right now, I'm just using this to control the CD-ROM drive, and this actually came with this unit when I picked it up. Now, when I picked this gateway up, it was in pretty bad shape. Most of the drives were missing, and there really wasn't many cards inside of it. Uh, I think there was just an ISA video card and this card. So, I, I don't know if this is stock. I don't know if it's true that these machines came stock with a SCSI CD drive, uh, or if this was the controller that came with it when whoever bought this thing originally bought it. But if I had to guess, I would say yes if, that's, uh, if everything's true about these coming with uh, SCSI controllers. So this is a VLB controller or the local bus and um, you know it has a floppy controller too. It has here's where uh, 50 believe it's 50 pin SCSI little dip switch here. I didn't have to do anything with this though. I didn't have to configure it or anything. It it was already set up correctly. Uh, I just put it in. Well I put it back in the machine. I originally uninstalled it because I wasn't going to use SCSI at all but when I decided to go with SCSI for the CD drive, I just put it in, uh, connected the drive up to it, it detected it just fine, and uh, all I had to do is set up the drivers and everything in the uh, .bat and .sys files. And yeah, it's worked just fine with the SCSI CD-ROM drive. I would suspect it would also work just fine if I decided to add or replace uh, with a SCSI hard drive. Now one component I had a little bit of trouble sort of locking down what was the stock component was the sound card. But after talking to people that said they bought this machine when it came out retail, a lot of people have indicated that it came with an early Sound Blaster 16, something like a CT1740. Would be my guess as to what kind of roughly what model of uh, Sound Blaster 16 came with this machine. Now, I don't have one on hand, so I'm using this. Uh, this is an early Sound Blaster AW32. Basically the same thing, sort of. I mean, it has a uh, real OPL FM built in right here integrated into this chip. Um, this is pretty much a Sound Blaster 16, except uh, maybe a little bit less noisy, and it has some MIDI synth uh, built into it and some memory built into it. Overall, this is a pretty decent card. Uh, you can see by the jumpers, it is not plug and play. You can set everything by the jumpers. Right here it has a interface for an IDE drive. I did try using this card with the CD-ROM drive and I was just having problems. Uh, but again, I chalk it up to the weirdness of this gateway. But yeah, this is just a fine card. You know, it gives you what it gives you some uh, OS32 synth and you've got your real FM OPL uh, with this chip right here. So another sound card that was indicated to me that might have came stock on this machine was this guy right here. Now this is a Jazz 16 uh, card, and as you can see right here, it says Gateway 2000 uh, 16 MV card. So this is obviously made for the OEM market and uh, Gateway 2000. So as I said, this is, uses the Jazz 16. Uh, it also has an FM chip right here, a real OPL3 FM chip. Uh, wavetable header, which the this at least this auth 32 
uh, actually lacks. There's no wavetable header on this card, but this card does have it. And then we have some connections here for CD-ROM drives. Um, I don't know, this this one might be IDE, and this one looks like some kind of proprietary uh, drive. There are a lot of different proprietary connections. Now, I uh, the seller, when I bought this card, the seller said this actually came from the same model, uh, Gateway 2000. So, again, I don't know if that was added later, or if some of those uh, Gateway 2000s uh, came stock with this card. Uh, I did originally try to use it, but I believe this card is defective. Uh, there was a lot of issues with it. It wasn't seeing the FM chip, uh, and it was just beyond noisy. There's a lot of crickly. You could barely hear the audio. I tried doing uh, a lot of things and messing around with a lot of options, and um, I just couldn't get this card to work right, so uh, I'm pretty sure this card is defective. I might come back to it later, maybe try to get another one of these and uh, try it out in a different build. So finally, we come to the video card. Actually, this was a very, this was a, one of the easier components to figure out what this machine came with stock. Pretty much everyone I talked to indicated that this machine came stock with a uh, VLB Local Bus Mach 32 card from ATI. Um, now, this is a pretty hard card to come across. Uh, it took me a while to find one of these cards at a semi-decent price. I still had to pay a premium for this card. And, you know, those of you in the know might know right away that this actually isn't the exact type of card that came with this model of Gateway 2000. Uh, this is actually more of the higher-end retail version of it. So the Gateway OEM version was actually pretty much the same card, except this card's a little bit interesting, as in it has two... Uh, DACs it can use and the gateway version actually had a chip right here and this socket was empty and it's actually kind of a lesser DAC and but you can I believe you could if you had one of those OAM cards you could just remove this one and if you could find this one put it in and you'd basically have uh, the better version of it. As you can see here this has the full two megabytes of RAM the OEM version came with just one megabyte but that's no big deal you can always upgrade that. Now there are two, there are some different versions of this card with RAM. I believe there's a DRAM and a VRAM version. I'm not quite sure which one's considered faster. I believe this is the VRAM version. Uh, the DRAM version would just be more sort of traditional chips like this. Uh, again, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Now overall, this is a pretty sought after VLB card. It's considered one of the higher end VLB cards. And like I said, uh, you're going to be charged a premium if you're looking for one of these to buy. Uh, I don't, DOS compatibility is, from what I hear is eh, not terrible, but not great. Uh, definitely not like an S3 card, but it is pretty speedy. Uh, at least in like Windows 3.1, I heard it's a very good Windows accelerator, but so, you know, DOS compatibility, maybe, eh, haven't played around with it too much yet, uh, but still a very fast card. Alright, so for this video we're just going to do the quick and dirty method of pointing the camera at the computer and the monitor and just hoping it comes out uh, passable. Doing this for a multitude of reasons, but uh, my recent videos have had a lot of sound issues, so I'm sort of trying to avoid doing any direct audio capture till I really have that you know, figured out and uh, all straightened out. Um, so anyways, yeah, here's the computer uh, posting and booting up. I always like to get that with my uh, computers. And then we're just going to take a look at some couple quick benchmarks and then move on to some gameplay footage. I always like to take uh, benchmarks. Um, now the benchmarks on this, the numbers I got, they're pretty similar to my main 46. I think part of what's holding this machine back uh, might be the smaller amount of L2 cache. If we remember, this machine just has that 64 uh KB stick in it as opposed to, you know, the standard 256. Yeah, so here we are just running a couple quick uh, benchmarks and then we're going to take a look at Doom. And Doom runs, you know, as you would expect Doom to run on a 66 megahertz 46, which is quite playable. Fine, I, I really can't complain about how it runs, so uh, yeah, it's, it runs just fine.
So here we have Commander Keen 4, and this is a good game to use to test graphics cards. Uh, it will show if they have any problems. Now, as you can see from the title, and here we get into gameplay, uh, the Mach 32 VLB card and probably the PCI and ISA cards has a scrolling issue with this game. Now, as far as I know, there isn't a, a patch or a workaround uh, to fix this. Now, in the options menu, there is a little box you can check mark that says something like, fix scrolling issues, but checking this box has no effect and it actually does not fix the scrolling issue uh, caused by this card. So yeah, this is just one of the little incompatibility issues uh, that we were talking, that I mentioned earlier about this uh, particular card. <laughs> Real hospitable of you, Ham. Threadbare, cockroach infested, grease stained accommodations. I've never seen anything like this in all the years Ham's toyed with us. the Gateway 2000 for DX266V, uh, whether in the desktop form or the tower form, if you come across one of these things, pretty much regardless of the condition, uh, pick it up if the price is right. They're getting kind of hard to find and these are definitely iconic for the mid-90s and they're just awesome machines. They're awesome for collectors if you just collect and you just like the look of this old hardware. This thing is a beast. It's impressive. Uh, it's really an eye-catcher. I know a lot of people love anything with Gateway 2000 on it. And if you do love Gateway 2000, this is the 486 machine to have. Uh, there's other cases. There's smaller ones. Um, even desktop. I've had a desktop one that was 
a little bit smaller. It had an early Pentium in it. Just wasn't, there's just a certain coolness factor with this. It has the, the upgrade slot on the motherboard. Uh, it's just really cool. Try to get it with the keyboard if you can. Unfortunately, I don't have a matching mouse, but still an awesome machine. Uh, issues with this machine, like I said, had a little bit of trouble setting up the CD-ROM drive. That might have just been my machine. That might have just, it might not be a problem for you, especially if your onboard IDE controller is working all right. Um, other than that, the power supply, I wish it wasn't like a big hulking, not sort of proprietary form factor. Uh, if that dies, it might be a little bit of trouble finding something that fits right. Other than that, the stock card that came with it, the uh, ATI Mach 32, pretty fast card, but it, it does have some compatibility issues as we saw with Keen. I actually did put in a different card. I put in a Cirrus Logic VLB card and the scrolling problems with Keen cleared right up. So it's still a great card, a uh, bit overpriced on eBay. Great card, but you might want to consider swapping it out for something else, maybe. Uh, it is fast. It's, it, I did a few light benchmarks, and it did clock a little bit faster than the Sears Logic card I uh, replaced it with. But again, a little bit of compatibility problems. Um, that's something to look out for, a video. Of the years, I've accumulated a couple high-end VLB cards, so I'm thinking about doing a benchmark face-off in the future. Uh, just between a couple of these higher end cards so we'll see how that turns out but yeah this is an awesome machine uh, i'm glad i found it i'm glad i've been able to put it together at least as much as i can great for collectors also great if you just want a 486 to mess with it will do the job it will play most of those games and you've still got a lot of upgrade options so thanks for watching this video i hope you enjoyed it if you want to learn more about the gateway 2004 dx 266 v there's a lot of other cool videos on YouTube about it, so uh, check them out. And uh, thank you guys again. If you like this kind of uh, content, please subscribe.